great to have you here. This and here is the California Institute of Integral Studies for those of you that are new to the area. This is the center of the spiritual universe. <laughs> and we have so many just great people here. We have um, our president, Joe Subiando. Please welcome Joe here. And, and Jimmy Johnson here, who actually taught in the traditional knowledge program, the only place in the world that was given a PhD for traditional knowledge. And that was fantastic while it existed. Please and welcome Kenny. And we have, we have Peter Baumann over here who's organizing the conference I mentioned to many of you. Being Human, September 28th is going to be a fantastic event. And if you thank him, he might get you in free. Peter Baumann. <laughs> we have, um, Bill Twist, who is changing consciousness around the planet with his Pachamama Alliance, which in part was put together by um, Drew Dellinger. It's amazing he's back here. He just finished with his PhD. It's glad to see him again. Everybody, Bill and Drew. And then finally, I just want to point out Karen Harwell, aficionado of place, a leader of the permaculture movement, raising goats and pigs and like um, all sorts of things in the middle of Palo Alto. Yeah. Thank you for coming, everyone. Karen Harwell. Louis Herman is one of a, a new breed of human being, and, and there are a few of you in this in this room that are in the same species. He's a planetary human in that he has he has crossed over the boundaries from a tribalism through nationalism into a into an emergent planetary consciousness, and with a, a way forward that includes digging back into and embracing our, our primal roots. We, um, we welcome him, and we want to let him know right now that he's one of us. So please bring on Louis Herman. Thanks, folks. Uh, it's really great to be here. Um, you know, I, I felt part of this institute before I knew it existed. I had, uh, this, is, this is quite a closing of a circle for me because um, my life has really been uh, devoted to uh, searching for, uh, for what the good is, trying to, improve, trying to improve my life and the life of my community. Uh, born in uh, unusual circumstances in South Africa, during apartheid South Africa, my search took me all over the world, and in the process, I committed myself uh, to, um, after a long sort of struggle in the field, to an intellectual life, and came across uh, the works of uh, three scholars um, who I, I had no idea uh, when I came across them, one at a time in different stages of my life, that they were actually connected with this institute. Uh, the first was um, Stan Groff. Uh, very soon after he published uh, his first book, um, Realms of the Human Unconscious, in 1980. Um, enormous revelation, reading Stan's work, um, his systematic exploration of the human unconscious, the human psyche, uh, using a powerful entheogen, uh, LSD-25, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, one of the great scholars associated with CIIS and with Esalen. Um, helped me uh, understand uh, my first psychedelic experience, uh, which was a shattering experience, uh, revelatory, but I had no intellectual framework for making sense of that. Uh, it came soon after uh, another shattering experience, which was uh, participating in a Middle Eastern war uh, as a paratrooper in the Israeli Defense Forces, 1973, uh, confronting some extreme experiences and uh, realizing that ideology and politics was a matter of life and death. Um, and uh, Stan helped me uh, see the connection between my own deepest experiences and uh, the long history of uh, the human search uh, for a better way to live, uh, the history of shamanism, the two million year old human being that is uh, alive in us all. Uh, soon after, uh, I encountered uh, Brother Brian, Brian Swim, one of Brian's essays, The Return of Cosmic Storytellers. And um, 
It was another small revelation, a huge revelation in a small form, short essay. Uh, but what it did was to connect my uh, early encounter with uh, cosmology, with the new science uh, at high school. I was introduced to the new sciences, to the evolutionary picture, this integrated story of an evolving cosmos. Uh, it was dealt with entirely scientifically. There was no recognition of what sort of emotional, spiritual, moral impact this should have on human beings. Uh, but it was clear to me that this was, again, revelatory. But I had no way of connecting this vision to my politics, which at that time were centered around Zionism, uh, utopian socialism of the Israeli kibbutz movement, the vision of returning the Jewish uh, scholar, the entrepreneur, the middleman, Jews have been wanderers without land, uh, without a, a balanced form of existence for 2,000 years, taking them and returning them to the original tribal homeland. I was completely swept up in that vision, and uh, the vision of uh, this emerging cosmology, the work of Tayyad Shah Dan, who I had the, the privilege of being introduced to um, soon after high school, uh, seemed to have no connection to my politics. I couldn't resolve that. and then. When I read Brian's work in, I think it was 1984, 1985, um, I suddenly saw how uh, this um, incredible revelation of modern science had implications for politics. And Brian laid it right out that this transformed everything, uh, forced us to adopt a planetary consciousness, a planetary politics, but in a way which would find place for the particular, the the. Inter the integrity of each culture, each nation, each tribe, and ultimately each creator free individual. Um, it was uh, quite a bit later when I started putting it together. I was doing a dissertation in political philosophy at the University of Hawaii. Uh, I'd been struggling to uh, make sense of my life's experience, which covered an incredible range of apparently contradictory experiences. And um, I'd been immersing myself in the history of Western philosophy and uh, was trying to make sense of it all and trying to integrate a, a shamanic consciousness in the work of the new cosmology, Brian's work and Stan's work, uh, when I encountered Rick's uh, passion of the Western mind. Where's Brother Rick there? Yeah. And um, that again was the missing piece. I mean, that allowed me to, to understand the whole history of Western mm -hmm. philosophy as a single narrative exploring the human condition and arriving at a dead end at the, what we call the double bind of uh, the postmodern box canyon of political philosophy, essentially giving up on the truth quest, giving up on the notion that we could have compelling binding, uh, compelling knowledge of the good, the good of all, and at the same time still be open to new knowledge and new learning and not get caught up in dogma. And uh, the epilogue really provided me with uh, the perfect stage uh, for developing my own ideas about a political philosophy which was grounded in the emerging cosmology in my, in my deepest formative experiences um, and which um, uh, built on the achievements of the history of, of Western civilization culminating in the scientific revolution and the philosophical clarification, even the deconstructivism of, of postmodernism. Uh, it's it's quite clear that um, our civilization is in crisis, that uh, we're deeply confused about the nature of the good. Politics is widely regarded as corrupt, polarized between the fundamentalism, murderous fundamentalisms of the left and right, the middle is corrupt, confused, people are cynical, uh, it's, uh, academia has given up, uh, the question of the good, the true, the beautiful, uh, unfashionable, uh, many academic, I mean, it seems as if philosophy hasn't really recovered since the scientific revolution. And this notion that um, somehow other objective knowledge and compelling knowledge excludes subjectivity. Uh, Wittgenstein's famous uh, declaration at the end of Tractatus, after all the questions of science have been asked, there are no more questions. And this itself is the answer. A uh, kind of deformed mysticism. Uh, suggesting that we effectively give up a serious philosophical search for the good, uh, the truth of a better way to live.
uh, we have you know, public opinion polls. Uh, the day America told the truth, but at the time, the largest survey of public opinion ranking professions in terms of int integrity ranked politicians somewhere between uh, prostitutes and used car salesmen. You know, it's a sad truism of political life. Uh, the most poignant uh, sign of this was uh, came from Bishop Desmond Tutu about uh, two months ago when he was talking after being given the Templeton Prize for Lifelong Work and Spirituality. It was reported in the Port Elizabeth newspapers where I was. I was in South Africa about two weeks ago. Uh, South Africa was the flavor of the month when apartheid was abolished in 1994. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission was set up and its citizens were riding high in the victory of the World Cup. Everybody knows uh, the heroic story of Invictus, the World Cup, this generous gesture uh, by Nelson Mandela, mobilizing the black population in support of the hated game of rugby, the symbol of Africana racism, an extraordinary event. Uh, the world was thrilled when freedom came to our land. We can't pretend that we've remained at the same heights, and that is why I say to you, please, for goodness sake, recover the spirit that made us great. One prays that our land recovers the spirit of Ubuntu, Ubuntu being this uh, also notion of the universality of humanity, that we are all one underneath religion, ideology, race. We are all one humanity. Primal intuition. Many indigenous cultures, most indigenous cultures, have the sense of a common humanity, despite the differentiation into tribes and nations. One prays our land will recover that spirit, recover our sense of worth, and become a generous and compassionate society. Um, it, it struck me as... Um, as um, uh, quite in a way pathetic that we have no way of developing a politics of this. It's as if, you know, it would be enough to say, for goodness sake, please be good, as if we knew already what good was, and highlighted the urgency of, of this task of developing a, uh, an epistemology, uh, a politics, a pedagogy, a political philosophy based on on the good. What is the good for humanity? What is the good for the planet? On, on a way of searching for this. Uh, I want to make, my, my claim, my suggestion is that uh, there's a very simple method. That it's primal, that it's hardwired in the individual, it's hardwired in the structure of consciousness. We all do it. And that when we become conscious of it, um, we can see that this is operating as the central ordering mechanism in primal societies. Um, see it most clearly in the, the Sun Bushmen, uh, who we now know, the Sun Bushmen of my native South Africa, we now know are the oldest uh, culture on the planet, speak the oldest languages, have the oldest genetic material, the first to branch off that human lineage that came out of South Africa. Uh, we all know in our lives, in our own lives, that we can make decisions which are, are good and bad, better and worse. Uh, the good is, a, is a, the good and bad are realities, existential realities for every single one of us. Uh, we all know the part determines the, the whole determines the part. The meaning of the part uh, relies in, to some degree on its relationship to the whole. We all know that our understanding of reality is limited. That uh, however brilliant we are, however much history and philosophy we study, however much science we grasp, um, that its meaning is constrained by our stories and that we expand our stories as we connect with others in honest discourse. Uh, so really we've got uh, three dimensions of that are essential to the truth quest. And we know that our communication with others is valuable and true and enhances our understanding of reality to the degree that it's democratic, that it's honest, that it's egalitarian, that it's not constrained by power. Uh, what I want to suggest is that by um, clarifying these four components, the four cornerstones of the quest, which I'll go over, and cultivating them uh, and placing them at the center of our pedagogy, uh, we can make sense and meaning out of our science and out of our history and out of our critical philosophy. Uh, and we find that in the process of uh, bringing this method, it's essentially a method, a truth quest, uh, into consciousness, into the centers of our lives, uh, it starts ordering our lives uh, and becomes the core of a politics. Um, the search for the good life becomes in part an embodiment of the good life we see. <laughs> it's a simple sort of playing the Tao of politics. Uh, if I may just say a few words about my story, because it might um, illuminate how this came to me, and you can see it, how it operates in my own life, and then show you a couple of pictures. 
from the human story, and then we can talk in more detail about what these, how these four methods, how these four components, these cornerstones of the truth quest, uh, are embodied in the life of hunter-gatherers, simple primal societies, uh, how they reappear in the polis, and um, how they seem to be reappearing today. That this is part of the human condition, and what is needed is a leap in consciousness, grasping this intellectually in philosophy and history in science, uh, cultivating it, and institutionalizing it. Uh, I was born in South Africa, white, obviously, but Jewish, in a racist country during apartheid. Um, contradictory experiences. Uh, I knew I was an Afrikaner. The, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the basic uh, history of apartheid system of racism institutionalized by uh, the Dutch, original Dutch-German settlers, the Afrikaners, um, under the leadership of Vervoet, uh, racists studied in Nazi Germany, the idea of being total separation of all the races according to a hierarchy uh, with Europeans, blonde, blue-eyed Aryan Europeans at the top, and at the very bottom were Bushmen, just above primates. Um, Jews were some, Jews were technically white, uh, but it was, you know, a, year, a few, few years after the death camps, and it was clear that the whole system of apartheid was connected with uh, the atrocities of Nazi Germany, the Holocaust. Um, I grew up with that still fresh in family memory. Uh, friends, uh, families had been involved in the Holocaust. The Jewish community of South Africa came from Lithuania. Uh, it was a very homogenous community. 90% of those who remained were annihilated in the Holocaust. So this was one of those formative experiences for me. Uh, but at the same time, middle class uh, got a semi-decent education. I was brought up by blacks, by tribal blacks, like many middle class families. I got an intense dose of tribal culture in the most loving and gentle way. My caretakers spoke closer. Uh, I ate their food, I listened to their music. I spent a lot of time outside the bush and beach. Grew up in Port Elizabeth, um, close to um, some of uh, the most uh, magnificent wilderness scenery in South Africa. Some of the oldest ecosystems, going back to the breakup of Gondwana land, um, 200 million year old bush, beach. And we now know uh, the remains of, uh, the richest remains of that last leap into modern human consciousness are to be found on the coastline in caves that I used to play in as a kid, a little knowing consciously, intellectually, what I was playing with, uh, understanding intuitively, in a way, having these incredible experiences of being connected to the beauty and wildness of the place. Uh, half an hour from the city where I grew up in, we could encounter a herd of wild elephants, uh, unique subspecies to the Eastern Cape bush, the arrow elephants, smaller reddish in color, smaller tusks, um, completely wild, uh, surrounded by huge fins. So I grew up with some of the primal realities of Africa in a civilization that was sick, that I knew was sick, that was dangerous, that was dangerously connected to the Holocaust. Uh, sort of a nature mystic, I had no words for any of this. Uh, but also brought up as a Jew, as a Zionist, believing that the proper place for Jews were, was Israel, returned to the ancient homeland. Uh, I escaped. Uh, my family took me to England at a young age. Uh, I was 12, had my bar mitzvah in, uh, in England, went to high school in Cambridge. Um, had uh, the privilege, good fortune, to get a scholarship to the University of Cambridge, study medicine, which I hated. Came from a family of Jewish doctors. and. Uh, it seemed as if it was just an automatic repetition. Um, the issues that were at the center of my life were uh, existential moral issues. Uh, what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad. How could apartheid be accepted as uh, the best regime for an entire country like South Africa and be condemned and excoriated in uh, mild and pleasant, green and pleasant liberal England. Uh, you know, clearly there were different realities, and the realities had different notions of the good, and they had immense consequences. Uh, got the benefit of great scientific education. Uh, encountered the new cosmology um, in my first semester at Cambridge. I was introduced to the work of Teilhard, and immediately understood that uh, I was a product of a 13 billion, 14 billion year old evolutionary process. It was uh, mind blowing. Uh, to put it, uh, to say the least. Uh, no one really talked about it until I encountered the work of Teilhard, uh, but uh, Teilhard's Christianity got in the way of my uh, putting this into practice in any political way. Center of my life was uh, Kibbutz Zionism. 
Uh, I was very confused uh, politically. I majored, I wanted to get out of medicine, I needed to answer these questions. Uh, these were urgent, practical, existential questions for me. Uh, majored in history and philosophy of science in my final year. Understood the limits of science, understood that science couldn't answer these questions. Saw that my colleagues, uh, many of my students, my professors, brilliant, uh, often neurotic, cynical, some suicidal, clearly didn't have the answers. Uh, the university was not a repository of wisdom. Uh, <laughs> Decided to take a break from academia, uh, moved to Israel, went to live in kibbutz, uh, attracted by the idea of utopian socialism, voluntary community, democratic, egalitarian, men and women, uh, equal power, decisions made through face-to-face -face discussion, this is the culture I was brought up on, uh, made perfect sense. Uh, for a year I worked uh, in the fields as a laborer, barely read anything, uh, and then volunteered for military service, spent two years in a paratrooper unit. Um, the truth is, I, I actually had a wonderful time. It was a life of the body. It was exactly the opposite of my Cambridge existence. Uh, I um, suddenly understood uh, more about philosophy than I'd learned in my entire years of schooling, the difference between language and experience, the meaning of the primary virtues, courage, generosity, friendship, honesty, um, it was uh, an extraordinary experience. I was living uh, a life of the body, um, outdoors young man, uh, feeling tough, dangerous, uh, and feeling heroic. Uh, this was in the, 70, in the 70s, before the Intifada. Uh, the Israeli military was trained to fight border wars against invading armies. We knew they were led by uh, often military dictators uh, for in uh, leading repressive countries, repressive regimes. Uh, we felt we were hero heroic. We felt uh, after the Six Day War that uh, Israeli rule was enlightened compared to, to the military oligarchs that had uh, run the, the Jordanian uh, Palestinians. Uh, when the war started in 73, uh, I was in South Africa. I returned late, joined my unit in Egypt, uh, the war full on, and confronted. Uh, the fact, uh, in a strange way, uh, I had a sort of visionary experience during the war, during the fighting, um, that Arabs were indigenous to the land, like Jews. The feelings that I had for the land, uh, the feeling of being at home, the tribal homeland, was shared by, obviously, Palestinians and by Arabs, and um, saw a lot of death. Some of my friends were killed. I came out unscathed and uh, confronted again the Socratic question. Uh, in uh, a life and death way, you know, how should I live? What is the good life? Um, I started studying political philosophy at the Hebrew University. Uh, I was fortunate enough to encounter a visiting prof from the University of Hawaii uh, who had opened up political philosophy to all the disciplines, uh, included shamanism, Castaneda's books, um, uh, teachings, uh, Buddhist teachings, uh, plus a brilliant grasp of the history of Western philosophy. Uh, encouraged me to come back. I went to Hawaii and um, did my PhD under him at the University of Hawaii. Um, and Hawaii offered me, um, quite unexpectedly, the perfect philosophical distance that I needed from my, my tribal, from my cultural roots uh, to get a plan. I was forced into a planetary vision. I had no, cha no, <laughs> no alternative but to, to acknowledge the fact that the most pressing problems that uh, were facing Jews in Israel, Palestinians, South Africans, Hawaiians and Americans were global and planetary became increasingly obvious to me. And um, over the course of several years I had a series of revelations which started putting all of this together into uh, a narrative with um, an emerging structure of the Truth Quest at its center. Now maybe I can just show you a couple of pictures I don't want to go on too long. Uh, yeah, how are we doing, right? Doing Uh, just a word about this slide, the mantis, the praying mantis is uh, the embodiment, the Bushman uh, uh, trickster, the embodiment of the trickster, the trickster deity. Um, like trickster, 
uh, throughout the indigenous world the embodiment of uh, greed and lust and uh, uh, inflated ego, the, the parody of human excess, uh, but also the creator of the universe. And it's this idea of the coexistence of opposites. Yeah, I saw your brush that out when you first took that picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, beautiful. Yeah, the trickster loves. So this is the perfect reversal. Yeah. Uh, the cutting edge of science reveals that human consciousness emerged out of our capacity to grasp the world as an object, to put men on the moon, emerged out of an evolving wilderness. Uh, which is ultimately incomprehensible out of this great mystery that we find ourselves part of. Uh, Bushman had an intuition that this was the case and that reality was paradoxically constructed because consciousness was paradoxically constructed. Our consciousness is a work in progress. This is the human condition. This is what modern political philosophy ignores. Um, the, the circle as a whole represents about 100,000 years. Uh, we've had our modern form of consciousness for at least 100,000 years. It's more like 200,000 years. We, we now know between um, 200 and 150,000 years modern human consciousness, self-reflective consciousness emerged with our capacity for free choice and imagination, memory. Uh, civilization, the Neolithic, about 10,000 years old, but really civilization in the sense that we understand it, written languages, monumental architecture, much less, uh, about 5,500 years old. Uh, one millionth of the history of the earth. And of course industrial civilization whereby we've cut ourselves off from uh, the basic fact of life that we are wilderness made is very, very recent. Uh, 500 years, 16th century is really the takeoff point for, uh, for modernity, but we really haven't lived, surrounded ourselves by cities, by artifacts um, until about 150 years ago, 100 years ago. And only recently uh, have we passed that point where most human beings now live inside, surrounded by stuff that other human beings have made. This is another version of the same thing, hunter-gatherers. Uh, we found skeleton on the South African coast, 125,000 years old, um, but we have evidence of human activity and symbolic activity that's much older. Agricultural revolution, 10,000. Three revolutions in human history, in human existence. The primal, the original, this explosion in self-reflective consciousness. Uh, between 200 and 150,000 years ago. Neolithic, between 10 and 5,000 years ago. Uh, industrial, very, very, very recent, yeah? So all our thinking about ourselves, our self-understanding, right here now in this room today, uh, we've got to factor in the fact, we've got to factor in the two million year old human. This is most of us, most of the time, when I say most of us, I mean our culture, is operating in a very, very narrowly constricted form of consciousness. Uh, so this is the basic model of the truth quest that we start off with, concentric circles. Uh, planet Earth evolves, starting from the outside in, the universe. The wilderness is what we refer to as a wild Earth. Out of our planetary wilderness, civilization emerged over a, an immense process. And then uh, the human comes to consciousness being aware that there's choice. Uh, and this catapults us into the truth quest. Choice means we can make mistakes. It wouldn't be freedom unless there were consequences, unless there was good and bad. So it's built into the structure of consciousness. Uh, we can't really have knowledge without implicitly choosing this is valuable, this isn't valuable. Yeah? This is where it took place. The original Garden, Garden of Eden. We don't know that this is actually where the first flowering in modern human consciousness took place. This is the southern tip of Africa. Uh, but this is where we found the most evidence. And when you uh, visit this coastline, Cape Town there, on the west coast, uh, Port Elizabeth on the east coast, uh, sweeping up from Antarctica, the Atlantic Ocean, freezing cold, uh, nutrient-rich, uh, warm Indian Ocean coming down the east coast, uh, coming down from the tropics, from the equator, uh, where they meet and mix is one of the richest fisheries in the world. Uh, it's also one of the richest botanic kingdoms in the world. Uh, I don't know if people know this. Uh, by far, the richest flowering kingdom in the world is on this coastline. Uh, it's a biological hotspot. Uh, it's a botanic and, um, and zoological uh, wonderland. Uh, I've marked three points at the bottom there, which uh, I'll show you pictures of later. Blombos Cave, uh, 
where we found the oldest remains of modern symbolic activity. This is what it looks like from the air. This is a Cape Point, often taken uh, metaphorically to be the southern tip of Africa. In fact, it's not actually the southern tip. But it's really nice because uh, to the left of the screen, the left of the slide, you've got the cold Atlantic sweeping up from Antarctica, and to the right, you've got the warm Indian coming down from the equator. So that peninsula is maybe five miles across, not even. And one side you can swim in warm ocean, the other side freezing, freezing cold. Yeah? And that's like you know, California cold, but colder. Uh, with kelp and seals and great whites. And uh, this is Great White Central. I'm sure you've all seen documentaries of uh, great whites of the southern point of Africa. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, so when we reflect on human nature and, what, uh, and, and how uh, human nature was constructed, what the constraints are in our um, spiritual life, in our emotional life, in our physical life, and of course in our political life, we need to keep remembering to place ourselves back into this sort of environment. This is what it looks like, really old rock, several hundred million year old rock, um, Feinbos, this fine bush called Feinbos in Afrikaans, uh, 8,600 species of flowering bush, 8,600, of which about 5,000. 800 are endemic. If you compare it to England, an area three times the size, uh, you've got about 1,500 species, of which about uh, 20 are endemic. Yeah? So this is you know, just a, a flowering of life on planet Earth. Uh, that's taken from those cliffs looking down. Looks like a um, shell of fish. It's actually uh, a pod of dolphins, and there are about 300 dolphins in that pod. Uh, took us a long time to figure out what we are looking at because it looked like fish. They were leaping out of the water as they're swimming around the point. Just gives you a sense of the richness. Bush and beach, bush and beach, wherever you go. Uh, rivers coming down, the early Dutch sailors saw uh, hippos uh, wading in the surf, surfing hippos. Uh, never seen anything like it. Called them sea cows. Yeah? Ah, the twenty first century primate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, connected, deeply connected. We'll come back to that. Uh, all the megafauna are represented there. Elephants walking down to the beach. Uh, this is today. This is that, that herd of other elephants I told you about. That's about uh, 20 miles from the coastline. Uh, originally all the animals were, would, would actually come down to the ocean. Kudu, one of the most regal of the African antelope. Very rich bush. Cape Canary, Cape Buffalo, one of the big five, what the hunters regard as one of the most dangerous animals to hunt. Love the mud. Saga boys, they call them mud lovers. Primate. This is the environment we emerged in. Yeah? What's extraordinary is that you can go, unlike the badlands of Ethiopia, uh, where many, many discoveries of, of early hominids have been made, um, when you in this environment you feel it's a Garden of Eden. Uh, it's incredibly beautiful. Uh, the complexity of the biome, of the plant and animal life, is absolutely fascinating. You can take any square meter and you can sit and stare at it, and insects and uh, birds and little creatures will start moving in it. You suddenly notice an area perhaps uh, 10 foot by 10 foot, you would find uh, several hundred species of flowering plants. It's like God's garden. Extraordinarily powerful experience. And there we have our 21st century primate on this beach, which is not very far from where those early remains were found. Those are fish ponds uh, constructed by uh, Bushmen. Bushmen roamed this whole area, sun Bushmen, hunter gatherers. Uh, the Dutch called them strandlopers, beachcombers. Uh, arrow points to Blombos Cave, where uh, the oldest uh, piece of um, symbolic expression has been found, 77,000 years old. That's the entrance to the cave. So uh, we wake up to consciousness with that sort of view of the <laughs> floor of the cave. Uh, shell midden, bone midden, uh, remains of uh, seafood feasting. Uh, there's a rib bone of an antelope over there in the foreground. There's some uh, 30,000 shell middens like this on the southern African coastline. Incredibly rich remains. There's that piece of ochre carved. Uh, we don't know what it represents. Um, 
all sorts of um, ideas. Uh, ochre is used to as the major pigment in the Bushman painting tradition, which goes back as old as the European painting traditions. Uh, we estimate as old. Uh, the oldest piece is actually 27,000 years old, associated with shamanism. Now, this is interesting. This is just an abalone shell. Uh, abalone shells like this were found with pigment in them, pig pigment that had been mixed 100,000 years old at the 100,000 year old layer at Longos Cave. Uh, linguistic and genetic studies confirm that the sun bushman of the Kalahari, hunter-gatherers, still practicing a hunting-gathering culture in the Kalahari, uh, are the closest relatives to that original population from which every human being comes today. Every one of us is related, comes through a bushman lineage. Bushman languages are the most phonetically complex. Hawaiian has about 14 phonemes. Phoneme is an expression of sound. English has about 40, uh, O has about 126 phonemes. Yeah? Uh, we find similar genetic complexity associated with ancestry. So this is the basic point. Yeah? The individual emerges in community. The truth quest takes place between the individuating individual in a rich social life. <clears throat> Uh, the, the, the depths of the truth quest are pursued in shamanic trance. Uh, this is the trance dance, the medicine dance of the sand. Uh, There's a contemporary picture taken in the Kalahari. Uh, the mechanism, very simple. Uh, magical songs uh, are sung uh, by the seated singers. Uh, the, the shamans, the dancers, anybody can dance. The whole community is involved, women, children, young, old. Uh, dance in circles, uh, short stamping steps uh, driven by repetition, by, by the songs, dehydration, enter the trance world and um, access healing, insight, visioning uh, in ecstatic trance. Uh, their accounts correspond dramatically to the accounts of uh, Groff's subjects uh, experimenting with entheogens, uh, exploring the, the hidden realms of uh, the unconscious using psychedelics. Uh, the spiritual, tradi spiritual traditions the world over correspond to Bushman accounts of what happens in trance. Uh, images from trance are painted on walls. There's some 15,000 painted sites covering South Africa. Uh, we have about 300 European sites paintings, yeah, something like that, two to 300. Uh, the rock art of Europe, the Paleolithic rock art. Uh, Chauvet, the oldest, 32,000 years perhaps. Um, Bushman tradition we reckon is as old, although because um, the shelters are all exposed to the elements and not sealed off as the European sites are, uh, very difficult to date. Uh, but we know that we have that pigment going back 100,000 years. We have worked pigment that goes back even earlier. Uh, paintings are incredibly complex. These are probably more recent and um, the most significant, the most complex seem to depict shamanic experience, shamanic trance, merging into the animals, merging into the early times, merging into the dream times. Uh, so here we have the model. This is the basic model of Bushman politics, of primal politics. Uh, also the basic model of the truth quest. Consciousness emerges within the field of wilderness uh, with individuated human beings, right? What characterizes human consciousness is the separation of the individual from the group, the capacity of the individual to freely determine, to act as an agent, to freely choose, this realm of freedom that we have by virtue of our individuality. What's interesting about the, the Bushman is that you get a high degree of individuation, very individualistic, argumentative, um, in some ways competitive, everyone free to come or go, no one defers to anyone else, and at the same time you get a very high degree of cooperation. This is the conundrum for modern politics, particularly mass politics. How do we combine individualism with cooperation? Uh, the individual in, in Bushman society, this is done very simply through face-to-face -face discussion. Uh, the individual is constantly engaged in arguing, talking, telling stories with everybody else. Everyone is more or less equal. Uh, they have no chiefs. It's an egalitarian society. Uh, Periodically, chiefs might arise as spokesmen in times of conflict. Uh, bands would come together under a war captain. When conditions were good, bands would split apart and 
resume the, the foraging ban blueprint, egalitarian, democratic, men and women participating in decision making, discussions continuing until decisions have been made. Uh, everybody is uh, moving around from the whole person individuation. Everybody has, is in touch with the primal experiences of what it means to be human. Everyone is a producer, food producer, everyone an artist, everyone makes their clothes, their weapons, their tools, everyone sings, everyone dances, uh, everyone a politician, everyone a chief, everyone a priest, everybody is involved in the shamanic transcendence. Not all are equally gifted, uh, but uh, each individual has a great opportunity in the primal band of uh, having what Emerson uh, demanded for all of us, an original relationship with the universe. Everybody understands the conditions of life and wilderness. Each individual, if necessary, could survive alone in the bush. But being intensely sociable, it would be uh, an extreme hardship. Um, the face-to-face -face discussion is uh, honest, it's ongoing. Uh, if you don't get on with your community, you're free to come and go. Uh, everybody is listened to, uh, and discussion moves towards a consideration of the whole, the big picture. Uh, everybody recognizes that the community exists in a larger context. What's interesting is that we see the same structure emerging uh, the same basic elements emerging in uh, the classical period of the polis. A very different society. Hierarchical, a warrior society, a patriarchal society, but a society that developed a, uh, a high degree of individual brilliance in uh, tension with the surrounding empires, the battles against the Persian empires and other surrounding empires. It was as if the polis had conditions where it could decentralize, become small and self-sufficient, and in the process recognize those criteria, those conditions as conducive to an explosion of individual freedom and creativity. So in the polis you have um, a similar idea to uh, the Jungian idea of individuation, uh, truncated a little bit but expressed in the idea of the Homeric hero as um, a wily schemer, a ready fighter, a ready speaker, a man of stout heart, broad wisdom, who knows that he must endure without too much complaining what the gods send him. He can both build and sail a boat, drive a furrow as straight as anyone, beat a braggart at boxing, throw the discus, challenge the Fishian youth at wrestling, running, flay skin, cut up and cook an ox, and be moved to tears by a story. He is in fact an excellent all-rounder. He is surpassing Arete. This is the classic idea that in combining opposites, uh, you achieve a certain kind of human excellence and a certain kind of wisdom, which is a condition for democracy to flourish uh, and for the truth quest to proceed. The more ex you experience of life, the more you can contribute to the collective wisdom. Uh, we see face-to-face um, -face discussion as being the basis for the uh, direct democracy of Athens uh, and the truth quest in the Socratic dialectic. There's something in the face-to-face -face situation that confronts us with the fact that everyone is different and yet we share a single reality. And only by going back and forth and back and forth do we have a chance to construct a larger, truer picture. Uh, and then you've got the Greek concern with the big picture, with the whole, um, that uh, the integration of the individual and the integration of the community, the individual with the community and the community with the cosmos uh, is essential for a good order. Uh, I would like to open it up soon for discussion, um, but uh, perhaps if I can just add a couple of examples from my own story, or should I just go straight into? It probably will work out. It probably come out in the interaction. If you're, if you're willing to open it sure. up, sure. Which sure. What we'd like to do is is to right now is to open it up to the broad discussion and what what's on your mind, what you want to interact with, moving about. And then after a certain period, we will invite our, our distinguished guests, uh, Rick Tarnas and Paul Carangella, to give their responses, and then we'll, we'll continue with further dialogue with Paul. So anyone who want, wants to begin um, interacting with Louis, now would be the time after we first welcome, um, thank him for his. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, folks. I want to practice a little bit of what uh, I'm talking about over here, and that involves, you know, hearing something from you. No. 
you know, ideally we should go around and get everybody's story and spend several months at this. And then <laughs> Paul wants to do that. <laughs> Dance, ah. Uh, <laughs> that comes afterwards once we share stories. Who wants to kick off? Clara, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> What's on your Not mind? I've got a question. Or I have a Great. Oh, anyway. Sure. I, oh, I just wanted to hear your thoughts, uh, or your experience when you were in Hawaii. That was around, I'm guessing that was around the time when um, the Native Hawaiians were really coming to some empowerment, and I right. was just wondering what your experience of that was, right. if you were aware of that at the time. Or, sure. Yeah. I'd Great that. question, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I immediately identified with the Hawaiian sovereignty movement as equivalent to Zionism. Mm -hmm. you know, it, was a, it was a movement of national liberation. They wanted their land back. They recognized the connection. I mean, it's particularly strong with indigenous cultures, where the culture itself is directly shaped by the land, the relationship to the ocean, the weather, the plants. Um, and the hula is all is an intimate experience. It's a dance, really, with the natural environment. Um, and so, um, yeah, I supported it in, in whatever ways I could. I got involved with some of the community building projects. Um, but it became very angry, very quickly, um, and a little bit exclusionary. And I could relate to that as well. Um, as a Zionist, uh, you know, I wanted to recruit the Jewish kids in Cambridge into the Abonem, you know, to build up a Jewish nation, take back their exiles, and I wasn't so interested in other people who wanted to, you know, join the movement. It was a matter of, of recovering the integrity of a community that had been damaged by colonialism, in the case of Hawaii, massively damaged, yeah? Um, but, um, you know, eventually I came to see that the, that the leaders of the sovereignty movement who were spiritually grounded and uh, were aware that we were involved in a planetary crisis were the ones who were at the cutting edge of that movement. And, um, the, and those initiatives were the most grounded, interestingly, in the land. They were actually doing community building work, um, reviving the Lowy, um, establishing that spiritual reconnection with the land, which you know all indigenous people have, which is missing, incidentally, in, um, in the thought of a lot of Zionists. You want to follow up? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, thank you. I wonder if you'd speak a little to the experience of uh, settler colonies, uh, thinking about South Africa, thinking about the United States and uh, Australia, places like that, where the vast majority of the people living there um, are not part of cultures that are grounded in those places right. necessarily, and what kind right. of transitional ideas you might have for, for example, white Americans living in California, uh, as an example, or I'm right. sure there are many others. Right, right. Well, I, I think it's a very similar dynamic, you know, and something that, that I've experienced, that, um, you know, indigenous cultures are closer um, to the extent that they are indigenous, that there's some integrity to the in indigeneity, uh, to that original relationship with the land as a sort of spiritually organizing experience and an experience which organizes their culture and so it, you know if you're in North America there's a privileging there should be a privileging of Native American cultures which are authentically connected to the land and, and many you know sensitive uh, European settlers um, who um, have, have a good understanding of the planetary situation and the global uh, expansion of Western civilization and Western culture and Western forms of consciousness, you know, recognize that this is one of the pathways back. If you are in North America, if you're in Australia, it's Australian Aborigines. If you're in South Africa, for me it was the Sun Bushman. That was the royal road back to the primal. Um, but, uh, you know, that doesn't mean trying to become mm -hmm. Indian or trying to become Bushman. Mm -hmm. uh, you have your own, you know, authentic path and truth trace back, you know, me as a Jew, I trace my path back, my Jewish tradition helps me trace my story back through the generations to that original exodus, you know, 2,000 years ago, or part of that exodus. And then through that, back to Africa. You know, I've actually participated in the genographic project and given a sample of my DNA and found that I have more genetically in common with Middle Easterners than I do with Lithuanians. I mean, it's extraordinary. Anybody can do this, incidentally, you just 
send a sample of your saliva to Genographic, and they'll, for a mere hundred bucks, they'll, you know, tell you what your lineage is. So, you know, it's a matter of, of, of self-knowledge, knowing yourself, knowing your story, and knowing your place in the big story. And everybody's different. And, you know, indigenous peoples, in many cases, indigenous peoples in South Africa and in Australia have lost their culture. And it's the settler culture that has stored this information, privileged it, and is really feeding it back to members of indigenous cultures. I mean, I see this happening in Hawaii all the time. I participated in it. I would teach Hawaiian kids about the illegal overthrow of the monarchy, and they were open-mouthed. You know, there I was, you know, a visitor to Hawaii, a Jew, you know, teaching Hawaiians about, uh, you know, their own history. You want to follow up? No? Yes, here we go. Here we go. Kimmy, and then we're going to we'll move to the next segment. Thank you very much for sure. your talk. I'm really enjoying um, My question, one of my questions that, for example, when you talk about indigenous people, they have a, usually they have a common land. They live in one right. place. Right. But now, as you have done in your life, right. some of us move a lot right. and live in different parts of the world. Right. So for you, what's the basic notion of community? When you say community for you, mm. wh what, is, mm. what is the community? Mm. Yeah. Uh, good question. What is community? Uh, many layers, many scales. I mean, this is obviously a community for me, a community I identify with, you know, a community of like-minded scholars, people on the quest, people with open minds. I feel very much at home uh, in this sort of environment in a way I, you know, wouldn't perhaps um, at the UH at the University of Hawaii or, you know, community in South Africa. Um, but um, in South Africa, I'm much more at home in the community of nature of the natural world. And that is, you know, if you like, my sort of species home. I feel a connection when I'm out. I was, I was in the bush and beach, you know, walking along the beach, uh, completely wild area. It, it could have looked the same 100,000 years ago. Um, and I was just checking out the plants at sunset. It was a very still day. It was a beautiful day. The air was full of the smell of the buchu, of the faint boss. Very, very strong smell. Um, the light was extraordinary. The smell of the ocean, the sound of the waves. Um, and I, it was an, a feeling of connectedness to this place and to the planet, to reality that was up there with my peak experiences. Uh, but my head wasn't spinning. I just felt extremely healthy and clear. And um, I could reflect on what I was going through in my personal life, which was kind of traumatic, and what we are going through in our, our civilizational life uh, in a very, very powerful way. So that is a different kind of community. And um, that is unique to me and my story. I was lucky enough to grow up on that coastline. And it's the same coastline that our species grew up on. And I think that convergence is not, you know, simply wishful thinking. Um, but, you know, Israel is another community for me. You know, and I think we've all got equivalents where we feel at home. I'm, I'm at home with a tribe in Israel. And I recognize that the Palestinians who more at home on the land and farm the land and have lived in villages with ancestry going back thousands of years in those villages, on those, those terraced hillsides. Um, so it's layers of, of community. And then what really excites me is the planetary community. And this is increasingly a you know, visionary construct. Um, and it's in communities like this that I can feel really part of the planetary community. And this is the really exciting drama that I think we're moving into. Uh, this um, this uh, heroic epic for our species that we are lucky enough to be conscious of and to participate in, that we're moving into a planetary form of existence within which all these other communities can flourish. Does that answer your... Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This is just uh, thrilling to hear you. What I'm hearing, uh, what I am looking for up here is that the specificity, when you talk about being on the shore in South Africa, that's your way almost into your relationship with the planet, right. with, with the globe. Right. But the specificity is important. And I think so many people do not have, I grew up on the prairies of western Nebraska, the high plains near Wyoming, and I have that relationship to that place. 
similar, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But finding a way in, in other mm -hmm. words, in here, where is the relationship with the earth? Mm -hmm. Where does that, is that the, commu the community of all beings? The commu I'm just looking for Sure, sure, no, good question. Great question. That's wilderness, the surrounding circle of wilderness. Every element of uh, every part, every component of the truth quest is in continual interaction, needs to be in continual shamanic resonance with the surrounding wilderness. And in the primal society, Bushman society, is the basic fact of life. It's not commented on because everybody's in that state all the time, more or less. And you've got some individuals who are very sensitive and gifted, and they move in and out of trance while they're hunting. And this has been recorded on film, and it's absolutely extraordinary. And you're with these people. This is the old way I'm talking about. I'm not talking about contemporary dislocated Bushman communities. And you can see that they're moving in and out of this, this the early times, where they, they can connect with animal consciousness. And they can see the kudu that's invisible beyond the next ridge. And they can feel the tapping in their chest. Yeah. So it's... In a primal society, it's accessible for everybody, if you've grown, especially if you've grown up with that culture. Where it's accessible for us depends on our specific location. It's going to be different for everybody. For you, it's the prairie. But every single one of us has the Southern African wilderness in our bodies. We all have access to that. We all have access to the night sky. Um, the rhythms of our breathing, um, the pulsing of our blood, the, the chemistry of our interstitial fluids, this is all shaped by an evolutionary process out of wilderness. Mm -hmm. So all the spiritual traditions can help you get in touch with this calming of the intellect, tuning into the body, all body disciplines. Um, in the book, there's a, I, I have a, a final chapter where I go through examples of where this is being revived in social forms, in individual forms, spiritual forms. Uh, and there's a toolkit, you know, simple things you can do to cultivate the wilderness within. Um, cultivate the truth quest in your life in different venues and so on. That's great. What we're going to do now is um, bring on our panel of distinguished scholars, Rick Paul, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and we're going to turn off these lights right here. Um, uh, I thought maybe we could form a little circle. You could be looking at them. Oh, that's and even like we're like a little campfire right here. We'll light my fire. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, as Louis says, um, Rick is one of his teachers, and, and Paul, through um, Manfred, is one of his teachers. So, now we can we can find out how Louis did according to his teachers. All right. So, do you have a preference as who wants to begin? Oh, okay. Oh, maybe I. I was hoping to have a conversation with Louis, uh, that we have a conversation with Louis. Here you go. About the fifth. It's about the fifth. The fifth presentation, yeah. And, and where in the world did you make these presentations? Uh, well, so far it's just been in the United States. Uh, East Coast, East New York City, uh, bookstores, Columbia, uh, and then uh, Virginia, uh, DC. Uh, it's a presentation to okay. invite the guests, and then uh, Harvard. Harvard, also. Uh, Can you think of the most challenging question? <laughs> I, mean, I really want to know what you don't know. Mm. You know what you what you still want to know. Mm. You want me to set a trap for myself? <laughs> <laughs> the truth question. The truth question. <laughs> um, 
you know, how does one apply this today? I think, uh, you know, how, how is this relevant? How do we work with this uh, in a way that we can actually create a, a planetary culture um, and feel significant in our own lives and you know, in our own context? Um, and depending on the audience, I mean, it was, the audience was, was interested in change. They were activist audiences. They wanted okay. to do something. So, so uh, yeah. All right, so, so you were speaking to your knowledge interest. Audiences which were very sympathetic. Right. Yeah. Uh, and cynical, too. And, and, and cynical, too. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it seemed. Uh, uh, it, it seemed that this was uh, a bit idealistic, you know, to hope that uh, we could suddenly have the truth quest at the center of our politics, our theology, our pedagogy. <laughs> and uh, so that was actually the most challenging and the most enjoyable question. Okay. Because uh, you do in the book speak of the emergence uh, of consciousness in a fourth revolution, which sounds like it's related to an emergency. It sounds like we're near the singularity, which will go one way or the other. Right. Good question. Good question. You know, is it? Is it inevitable that we're going to make this leap, or is it a matter of choice? Um, you know, I think it's, in a way, uh, uh, it's both. <laughs> it's paradoxical. It's, uh, I think we are in a crisis, we are in a singularity. Uh, I think it's, it's abundantly clear to people who are looking at the big picture. Uh, I think it's difficult to look at the big picture. It's difficult to see the sort of destruction that is taking place to um, incredible beauty of places like my birthplace, that coastline. Um, development, uh, Chinese money is coming in, they're building power plants, they're building a pipeline through that Feinbos, uh, a huge port, it's gonna be the biggest port in Southern Africa is being built, uh, well it's already built, it's being expanded half an hour uh, away from those elephants that I showed you. Um, to me, that is um, that is blasphemy. That is um, that area is a, is, a, is a temple. It's a critical, critical spiritual resource to give us the courage and energy and vision that we need to make the changes that I think are essential. If there isn't going to be massive suffering, um, I think it's easy to get uh, blown out, to get uh, cynical and depressed. Um, what inspires me, what encourages me, um, is the, the recognition that in grasping this big picture, in grasping the critical nature of our crisis, uh, we simultaneously grasp our capacity to change our consciousness. Uh, it's infectious, I believe, that once you've stepped out of the cave, it's transparent that there's an outside and an inside. And you can go back in the cave, but you can't forget that you've been outside. You've already made the leap. And this, people are making the leap. Uh, what we need to do, the urgent work I feel is visioning. We need to be able to see this as a coherent model that can be applied by everyone, pretty much everywhere, in a different way, depending on your context. Uh -huh. And that is what my, my model offers. It offers something that is built into the human condition, that we do anyway, that embodies uh, a new way of being that is more attuned to the basic realities of the human condition. And we have uh, dozens, hundreds, thousands of models where elements of this are taking place. Eco-villages, the country of Bhutan, models of decentralization, but nowhere are the dots being connected. When we connect the dots, magic happens. That is a pericope, that's a leap in consciousness. Um, and I feel that's infectious. When we do it publicly, yep, and yep, we yep. state it and we clarify it, um, it becomes self-evidence. It's yep. the luminosity of consciousness. Uh, it's, it's the self-illumination of consciousness as it expands. And when that happens, we've already yep. moved into this fourth revolution. Yep. Yeah? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh. But the truth quest you are describing, you are speaking of as already there from the earliest times. Right. And I see that as, uh, 
as very close to uh, a, a, a philosopher that you do use somewhat in your book, uh, Eric Vogel, about the, the nature of the human as being a searcher, uh, a searcher of truth. Uh, and there has to be in each of us a, a conversion, which I think you referred to the very mm -hmm. the turning around. But but that has been the case, I'd say, from the beginning. Uh, one of the figures you you pointed out in speaking of the polis is on, on one of your charts is uh, you spoke of the Socratic uh, dialectic Socratic but we do know what happened to Socrates right. Right. that Socrates death probably generated the work of Plato right. which then has carried right. that Socratic right. uh, 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 one one last thing I, I would like to say uh, in, in comment, uh, you can you comment on, on, on my comment here. Again, going going back to to Eric Bogan, and it's, he's not original in this at all. Mm -hmm. I think his work is a work of remembering, of anamnesis. If you use if you use that term in in the book, um, he's remembering. That the truth of the of the cosmos uh, depends on in, in the human being on faith and love and hope, and and, and the cosmos then is uh, it has to include the visible universe, but it has to include this other dimension, mm. and I think that's where a great deal of the resistance will come from, or it, I think it has always come from, but perhaps even more has it come over the last centuries of people, of, of, partly because of the fundamentalisms that you referred to, mm -hmm. of, of people uh, not finding an opening to, let's call it the, the divine, mm -hmm. and yet you and I know that there are people, people finding that all the time. Mm -hmm. With, uh, without them becoming preachy. Mm. Uh, but I think there's a real resistance uh, to that, partly because of the trauma of the, of, you know, the fundamentalist upbringing right. that so many people have. Right, right. I'll stop there. Right. Um, yeah, no, thank you for that, Paul. And thank you for Mary, uh, mentioning Eric Vogler, um, who I think is, has uh, probably done the greatest work in clarifying this paradoxical structural consciousness as we wake up um, in uh, a drama that is telling us, a story that is telling us, and, and what that implies for human political order. Uh, I think what the, the evolutionary picture adds to that is to clarify, uh, I mean, Stan Vogelin as well, that, that consciousness is a work in process, that there is, um, we are part of a single unfolding event and that the whole history of civilization and the emergence of the truth quest, the quest in human in its primal form uh, is, is part of something much larger, part of a much larger unfolding. And, and all we can do as philosophers and, and reflective conscious human beings is look around us. We hold the candle up and we explore behind and we explore to the left and to the right and to in front and we, we get a bigger and bigger picture of the human condition and um, we see where we're going, we see where we are, we see where we've come from, and we see what we could be. And, and this moment is different uh, to the crisis of the polis in the um, fourth century. And, um, and the challenge is different, and the scale is different. And uh, we know we've had three revolutions. We know there was a time where there were no human beings on planet Earth. We know that human beings emerged. We know that about 200,000 years ago, there was an explosion of consciousness which gave birth to language and to art and to the whole drama of the truth quest. Um, and that this drama has been, you know, has, has its own story, has its own narrative. 
enters into the civilizational drama. In the process, what I see that's very helpful is differentiation. Uh, consciousness is being very clever. It's, it's measuring, it's counting, it's storing information. Uh, and there's always the danger of forgetting the past, of losing that connection with where we've come from, which is the essence, if you like, of a relationship with the divine. And that is continual. The, the more we travel, the greater the danger of losing the connection to the past. But also, the greater the storehouse of information, science, history, etc., cosmology, that allows us to make that connection. But what it means is to make that connection becomes more and more of a choice, right? That's, it's more and more a matter of deciding, I'm going to embark on the quest and figure this out and find a better way forward. It requires that conversion experience, that this is doable, that we shouldn't just give up, zone out, watch TV, get drunk, and leave it all up to whatever. That, that we are in this extraordinary position of being agents of the next unfolding of this evolutionary drama. And that in recognizing our agency, there's a grandeur, there's an excitement, there's a, it's thrilling to recognize this. And this experience, it's an experience, it's a feeling. You get it, it's clear where you want to go with it. Yeah, I think that's why we all here. Yeah? But it helps to share you know, what this is, what its structure is, and to simplify it and do it in a form that is accessible to illiterates as well as to the most literate. And that, I think, is the power of the primal because it comes out of a society that is illiterate. And you can see it operating in an illiterate society. So it can be done in the classroom. And one of the things that I think is exceptionally, incredibly important is to develop a pedagogy out of this and a curriculum out of this. And this is what I've tried to do in Hawaii. And that involves doing things like starting any discussion by going around the room and getting everybody's story. Yeah. Which I would love to do now. I would do that. But perhaps we should yeah. move on. Rick? Because I haven't read your book, I'm hearing everything for the first time tonight, you know, and, and uh, of course there's I can I can feel how much more is in you than can be said in, you know, forty five minutes or uh, so that or an hour that, that Ryan may have um, permitted before he, he, uh, we, we took over with uh, questions and responses. Um, and I can see I mean, it, so much of what you're you're presenting, the spirit of it is so um, coherent with you know, what the kinds of, of aspirations and and uh, thoughts that we have been evolving in our community here. It's, it's, it's a very, very close kinship. And I have a feeling as you speak more and more, I, it's, I'm getting more of the nuances of the, of the connections. And, and at, at first I was, I was trying to grasp, um, and maybe this is like a, a, a good question I could just ask you and see if if there is some way in which you um, can unpack it, uh, that would be helpful for me. When you brought up, uh, it's like the, the good in many ways you're presenting as say these different indigenous peoples like the Hawaiians or uh, the Bushmen, it's their, it's their connection to the land and it's a sense of a kind of spiritual connection to the land that places them in a in a kind of uh, highly valued position in your cosmology, so to speak, and in your in a way in your politics too. But what happens when um, an indigenous uh, people um, evolves, let's say, highly hierarchical and even violently hierarchical uh, um, society? where there's like human sacrifice, as was happening in Hawaii for, for, for centuries before um, uh, Europeans arrived. Uh, and, and that question made me think of um, how you are unpacking this idea of, uh, of a heroic quest that is being um, pursued in the course of human history, and that in a certain way, 
the Bushmen are being presented as as a kind of paradigm of, of um, completeness, or at least uh, the, a kind of high ideal to which we can aspire. And I'm wondering whether, since you're saying we're, we're always doing this all the, all the time already, and we're all embedded in these deeper evolutionary and spiritual impulses that are driving through us as, as homo sapiens, uh, then how did this happen? Um, the global crisis sure. that we're in, sure. the, uh, the dualism, the, uh, the fact that um, you even would have a metaphor such as a cave of shadows and then moving out, you know, the right. platonic metaphor, et cetera. Sure. So I'm, I'm wanting to pull you out a little bit in, in uh, unpacking that, that, that narrative and what it implies for our moment. Critical, critical question, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, the, the, the Bushmen, the sun, are in a way the paradigmatic primal. And, um, you know, there's a big movement in anthropology uh, to debunk that. There's a whole revisionist movement that came out of postmodernism and deconstructivism. And, you know, a lot of it was valid. I mean, it's, it's not a perfect society. There's no perfect society. They're human beings. Uh, they fight. They get greedy. They get angry. Uh, they're jealousies. Um, and, you know, the model that we have is a model in wilderness where the society is more or less in balance. And of all the human societies we know, is the most egalitarian or the most democratic or the least gender stratification, as opposed to Native Hawaiian. Um, these societies come much, much later. You know, so we have a sense of, of um, a hunting gathering society similar to, to some contemporary Sun Bushmen. Uh, th there has certainly been transformation and evolution. Uh, but the, the critical variable, I think, is uh, a wilderness that is uh, relatively rich, that can sustain this community, and um, within which this community can be nomadic, and uh, where the constraints are small size self sufficiency, uh, where each individual uh, relates to others in a personal way. You lose this as societies become mass societies, as they become sedentary. Um, with centralization, uh, you get land that needs to be defended. Uh, with population growth, you get population movement, you get the settler populations. And this starts 10,000 years ago. This is not something new. This is something that has been you know, happening progressively throughout society. So, so what you've got is this sort of original template, um, which is not pure and perfect by any means, because with self-consciousness comes the possibility, uh, comes ego. Uh, even though we regard ego as a, as a modern construction, the brittle ego is very much a, a Western uh, construction, but you know, primal Bushmen have egos. I mean, they have a sense of being different. I'm different from you, and I'm not the kudu that I'm shooting, even though you know, at times I can merge with it. And so you've got this basic dynamic of good and evil taking place in these primal societies, uh, more or less in balance with this evolving wilderness. Um, but there's an inner dynamic that um, that is part of the drama of consciousness that plays out the history of civilization. And it's extraordinary to see that. I mean, you do a good job of chronicling that in Fashion of the Western Mind, how it plays out in philosophy. And it really is a drama of how, um, you know, the, the, this drive to understand reality and live a better life gets caught in a dead end. That happens. And the reasons why it happens depends on this interaction of many forces. The environment, the population explosion, the impoverishment of the European environment, uh, warfare, uh, patriarchy, etc., etc. I mean, there, there's a detailed history over there that we can explore. Um, what what we faced with now is um, a situation where the material conditions that we've established through the scientific revolution, through this differentiation, make it possible for us to take care of our material needs and make it possible technologically, practically, uh, for us to reinstitute some of these humanizing mechanisms. Uh, where you can have individualism, individuation, uh, the sort of spiritual, intellectual, physical development of the individual in cooperation with a diverse community. And we can now grasp this intellectually and we can provide the conditions materially, theoretically, perhaps for the first time. In a way, you know, we've created through the civilizational mess uh, the conditions for its alphabet, for its transcendence into something else, but it requires a leap in consciousness. I mean, this is what I'm suggesting, that the evolutionary picture, and this is why evolution and cosmology is so absolutely critical. I don't think it's dispensable. 
I don't think it's just an extra circle around the circle, but I think it allows us to see that what we have is a drama of complexity consciousness that is 13.7 billion years old, and it's reaching a threshold. There are many other thresholds. There was the original leap 200,000 years ago. Uh, there was another leap within the other thing. I mean, clearly, you know, that made it possible for you to write your book. You know, the beginning of literacy and the scientific revolution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, so there's something tremendous happening. And now this vision that we've got through this differentiation of civilization at this tremendous cost of repression of blood and devastation of the planet is providing us with the tools that we need to do something radically different. Radically different. A fourth revolution. Right? It needs to be radically different. We all realize that. Now, because the, the forces are immense. The forces towards increasing power for corporations, um, self-interested corporations are really controlling the planet on the global market. There's no intelligence guiding this. There has to be intelligence guiding this. What is going to guide that intelligence guiding the great forces that have been unleashed on the planet? It's got to be something that you know, resonates with all the wisdom traditions and the spiritual traditions, but you know, something that can be applied practically in many situations. Maybe this would be a good point to open it up again to the whole audience. And you, you, now you can, you can actually direct it to any one of the three up here. Maybe give Louie a break if you feel some compassion for him. But um, anyway. Yeah, Drew. Yeah, Drew. Drew Dellinger. Dr. Drew Dellinger. I just wanted to make a quick comment, which is that, um, you know, Thomas Berry is one of the kind of spiritual forefathers of our philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness program. And I think if you've read Thomas Berry's work, you might not know, I studied with him in the 90s, and he was really into Lawrence Vanderpost, you know, because he just loved, you know, he was, he was, I think, you know, Brian, you may know more about this, but I think Berry was one of the early people to really be into American Indian philosophy, you know, in, in academic culture. I mean, you know, of course, there was Black Elk Speaks and John Nehart and that sort of stuff, but I think he was out in, ahead of the curve. In, in terms of his admiration for indigenous thinking and indigenous philosophies. So I think, I just want to say, I think Thomas Berry would love your presentation. He used to carry, when I started with him in the 90s, he used to carry around a well, one-page sheet from Lawrence Vanderpost's really? uh, essay. And he would quote the one about, uh, you know, the, this, uh, this adolescent, basically, uh, Bushman goes out into, the, into, into the, uh, the bush and his father or uncle tells him, you know, remember, the, the clincher of the whole passage is he says, now remember, little cousin, when you're out, you are never alone in the bush. You are never unobserved. <laughs> and Barry used to say that, and he would just get this, he said, you are never <laughs> unobserved. He'd <laughs> get this beatific smile. He said, oh. You know, but I just think that, that that's, I just wanted to mention, yeah, invoke you. Thomas yeah. Barry's deep yeah. love of Bushman yeah. culture and indigenous yeah. culture and Lawrence Vanderpost to say that I think he would be thrilled by the combination and the connections that you're making between cutting edge scientific cosmology and deep primal indigenous wisdom. So I just wanted to invoke Thomas Berry. Thank you, no, Thomas you did a deep kinship with, with Thomas and Brian and Taylor. Thank you. Hi, Andy. <laughs> Good to see you again, Brian. Good to see you. I, I saw another Thomas Berry student here. Uh, <laughs> privilege of studying him for many years. And, uh, actually baptized by Father Thomas Berry, so I have a double, double advantage here. Uh, to my children. Um, Thomas used to uh, use a lot, the Father Thomas would talk about the entrancement of technology. And uh, one of my favorite expressions of Vogelin was immunitizing the eschaton. Uh, and you know, much of the work I do, which has to do with confronting genetic engineering, nanotechnology, both as an attorney and as, as an activist, there is a religious valence, enormous religious valence. Uh, so much so that you can almost see it as a second genesis. You can also see the, the attempt here, whether it be the synthetic biology, nanotechnology, to, to actually create a pseudo, and everything that's around us, a uh, technological cocoon that's a pseudo earth, it's a pseudo place. I think it probably is united with the idea of denial of death, the idea that the Earth, that we are all one, this planetary consciousness, does have a rather unfortunate ending, uh, biologically, even as we age, it's difficult. And they're creating a um, possible genetic immortality, uh, nanotechnology immortality. At least that's the, the, the claim. I, I serious scientific guys about that. But I was wondering where, where you know, when you look at the, the alternative um, fourth revolution, 
is how I view it, which is, the, which is complete technological entrancement and, tech, and a recreation of technology. How you see that in relationship to this, to, to this fourth revolution that you and I and so many of us see, I see it as a, a major, 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 major problem. And I think Brother Thomas did too. Thanks. Thanks, y'all. Um, thanks, Andy. Good to see you. Um, yeah, great question. Second reality. I think, um, you know, it's delusional. I think it's, a, it's more of the same. I don't think it is a, 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 another revolution. I think it's an attempt to escape from the human condition as opposed to confront the human condition. I think it's a failure of self-reflective consciousness. I think what we call to do is to uh, go deeper into what we are. I think in a sense we've been entranced with our creations uh, from the Neolithic revolution. That, is, that has been growing. Um, our fascination with our cleverness. It's the primordial sin of idolatry. Instead of worshipping the creative impulse, which is the divine coming through us, we worship the products of our creation. Uh, and that is the big mistake. And of course, the more brilliant we get uh, with our technology, and you can see this all the time, and it's growing and accelerating, uh, the more seductive the technology, the second reality becomes, the easier it is to fall. Uh, that's, that's the way I see it. I, to me, it's, it, it's clear once you start getting deep into consciousness. One, and it's simple. Self-reflection. Reflect on your deepest experiences. Make sure you've got some deep experiences to reflect on. <laughs> Step one. You know, yeah. go, go to opposites. Go to opposites. Exactly. <laughs> can you, can you, um, you, you use the phrase, uh, um, I think, uh, immanentization of the eschaton. And if you unpack that a little bit, then it, it would be more, you know, intelligible to everybody. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Unpacking Vogelin is a very dangerous method, as you know only too well. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but Vogelin, obviously, the, in this sense, he meant that the, the most banal way to put it would be heaven on earth. The idea that the eschaton of Christ, the esch eschatology of Christianity has to do with a heaven that the spirit goes through, through the spiritual progress, by our technological creations, uh, we promise a heaven on earth. We promise an immortality. We promise an immunitizing of the eschaton. Uh, and by that, by the way, would also notice that you would substitute hygiene uh, for purity, for inner purity. Uh, we might substitute rockets going to heaven uh, for a resurrection. Uh, we might uh, think that uh, synthetic biology is a new creation. Um, you know, Christ walked on water, but we have, you know, we have you know, water skis. That's what Tillman would call uh, literalism. Yeah, literalism being the worst thing. The whole thing is the sin of literalism. Uh, I had a question uh, in, in regards to the truth quest. What came up for me, uh, kind of, uh, and it, it also connects to when you said we have this wisdom inside us, was, is uh, the uh, quest of the lie that we're telling ourselves. There are many contradictions that are in the culture. So um, in order to, to do a successful truth quest, I would think that we have to be willing and able and have a context to do the, uh, the quest of the lies that, that construct and, and obscure a vision. Um, and that would happen in community, I would guess, but I'd like to uh, hear how we could do that, uh, the movement toward truth by really like unraveling the lies that we told ourselves in different cultures. Um, yeah, unraveling lies. Uh, you know, the in a small community where you live with people, uh, lies are quickly exposed. Uh, that's the power of face to face. That's the power of the dialectic. Yeah, you, you you obviously share reality, but you no two people can have exactly the same experience of the shared reality. We've all got a slightly different experience of this gathering, but it's one reality. Yeah. Um, if we actually lived together, uh, our lives would be exposed. I mean, you, you, you'd live your truth. You'd see the extent to which you live your truth. Um, so we've got to keep coming back to that. I think that's one way. You know, the, the more distant we get, the more distant the source is from the information, the easier it is for it to be deformed. Yeah? So, um, you know, I think it helps to make it concrete. What, what context are you talking about? I mean, the big lies of civilization, uh, the lie of, uh, you know, uh, 
indigenous as, as primitive as without religion, without politics. Uh, we expose uh, by spending time with the indigenous. I mean, simple, really. Uh, privileging the voice, listening, uh, but also exposing the deformations in the indigenous, the cannibalism, the hierarchy, the patriarchy, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so the bigger your picture, the more voices you are including. Yeah. Um, big part of truth is is purifying yourself. What is your motivation? Are you on a power trip? Are you trying to get something over that other person? Again, this is more transparent in a small community, a face-to-face -face community. You can see ego. You can't see your own inflation. Other people can. You can't see your own shadow. Other people can. Yeah? Jung's very helpful on this. You need an honest, loving relationship with others in order to get truth. Um, again, I think these things are relatively simple face to face. You know, it's, it's primal. It's simple. You know, I learned this stuff, a lot of this stuff in the army, where I came out of Cambridge, high bent intellectual. I had nothing but contempt for my you know, Israeli army buddies. You know, it seemed simple and crude and rude and blunt. Um, and I was quickly humbled. Uh, we depended on each other for our lives. Literally, we carried each other. We were, we were having the most extreme experiences of our lives. Also, some of the most amazing, really beautiful, biblical wilderness under the living out in the elements, living a hard life with the body. You see immediately who's generous, uh, who's selfish. These things are not abstractions. It's, you know, lying is irrelevant. You can see where people are. Uh, I think we need to, the more we get back to that, and the ways of bringing this in, in through the way you run your corporation, the way you run your school, the way you teach your class, you've got to walk the walk. So if I'm teaching the Socratic method to my students, and I'm saying what I teach you depends on what you tell me, I've got to demonstrate that I'm learning who they are, what their experience is, and make my curriculum relevant to their experience. It's a different kind of teaching. Yeah, It's not something that you can get from a book. You can only get it from the class and from listening to everybody. And it stretches me sometimes painfully. Uh, but it's also wonderfully satisfying. And what you get out of that is a community which is more of a truth-talking, loving community. Yeah? So I, I try, it's difficult to give you know, examples. But One of the things the, uh, the, national, the nationalistic ones that seem to be followed. Nationalistic yeah, ones. Those are the tough ones. Yeah, you know, again, once you've left your culture, uh, it becomes obvious. You know, leaving South Africa, going to England, I mean, it's clear they are telling each other different stories. It's Palestinians and Israelis. They're not listening to each other. You know, there's, no, there's very little understanding on the part of Palestinians of what the Jewish story and the Jewish suffering is, and vice versa. Israelis are deaf and blind to the Palestinian story. It's so obvious. You know, you've got to, you've got, similarly in apartheid, I saw it so clearly in apartheid. The people who, were, who hated the blacks the most, were the most contemptuous of black culture, were the ones most ignorant. Couldn't speak Kosa, not a word, nothing. You know, and, the, and where you get this interaction, Van der Post is a great example, uh, who was brought up by Bushman woman, and was open enough and brave enough to take in that knowledge, yeah? So, you know, that's why the medicine wheel, I think, helps, the, the mandala helps, because you move to opposites. If you're European, you move to the non-European. If you're hypermodern, you move to the primitive. If you're primitive, you move to the hypermodern. You balance the opposites in the circle. Thank you. Matt. Hey, Louis. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to the role that um, the axial religions have to play in the type of transformation you're talking about. What, what do they have, first of all, to learn from this much more um, primordial consciousness that's coming out of, of tribal cultures? Um, but also, what, what do they have positive to offer? Certainly, there are plenty of examples of, of how they've been complicit with uh, you know, the destruction of the planet and the stratification and hierarchical, hierarchical organization of human societies and so on, but what, what do they have to offer and what do they have to learn from these much more ancient uh, cultures? Sure. I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, thank you. Um, I think there's a sort of primordial, primal structure of religious experience, mystical experience in, in the emerging consciousness or primal societies, the, the, this ecstatic resonance with the natural world um, that you find repeated in mystics spontaneously and through various disciplines throughout the ages. Uh, you'll find something similar often in the prophets and saints and founders of the axial religions. Um, but I think that the, the context of civilization and the deformations of civilization, whatever they are, hierarchy, division of labor, patriarchy, etc., um, separation, physical separation, 
from this creative force that makes us from the divine uh, often obscures what they are. And so, you know, clearly to me, uh, the axial religions need to, to reconnect their own narrative to the narrative of human consciousness emerging out of wilderness. That is the, the primordial structure of, of the creator, it seems to me. That's fairly self-evident. You can experience this in various ways. In shamanic ecstasy, you get short circuit, fast contact with that realm that is beneath our socialization and our personality structures, you know, with the help of entheogens or the help of whatever the techniques are. Uh, as for what the axial religions contribute, um, you know, clearly there's this rich ritual and narrative structure associated with the axial religions, which is region specific, you know, Christianity, Islam, uh, Judaism, um, and a source of, of terrific conflict. But, but the ritual, um, you know, in my case, uh, connects me to the generations, connects me to the ancestors, right? I mean, you know, just those putting on the talus, the to fill in the prayers at certain times of the year, it connects me to a narrative that takes me back through my grandparents, great-grandparents, etc., etc., to Israel, to the land. Um, but I think it's important not to stop there. You know, take the story further back to <coughs> Africa and you know, ultimately South Africa, where, where our narrative takes us ultimately to the evolving world. Mm. Does that? You want to follow up? Oh, don't ask him that. Maybe a couple more. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm sitting here and I'm noticing, as I think, apart from the women that have been asked to speak, that the, the I, I don't recall hearing any other women speak yet tonight in the open forum. And that's a curiosity to me. I only just noticed it. And I think the reason I'm speaking to it is because I'm wondering if the model that I look forward to researching more when I have the opportunity, if the model that you see in your vision has the capacity to include through different means of entry the voices of those who don't necessarily follow an intellectual pursuit or follow a tribal pursuit or know how to speak with confidence in public. Because I think in terms of political implementation, it's very challenging to imagine a world that represents everybody if the forums themselves don't engender the kind of environment in which everybody feels capable of representing themselves. And so I would love to hear you speak to that, if you could. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, great question. Yeah, you know, it's the limits of time and place. It's true. Um, you know, all I can say is that, you know, in the primal situation among Bushmen, for example, when decisions are made, uh, they're always the individuals who've got loud voices, who talk a lot, tell great stories, um, dominate the conversation, uh, but they, they regularly don't make the decisions. Sometimes it'll be uh, an elderly woman who hasn't said anything throughout the discussion, listen to everybody. Uh, after a lot has been talked, she'll come up and she'll say, uh, I think this is the way forward, and the group will listen. Uh, because there is no institutionalized exclusion in this primal group, and because there's a recognition that um, the broadest range of the extremes offer the greatest wisdom. So often it's, it's the silent one who has the most important thing to say. Um, it's the noisiest one who you know, is entertaining, but you know, doesn't need to be taken care of. What you have that's a very interesting to me, and that's very, that's very profound, is this recognition um, of integrating opposites. So whatever is dominant needs to be balanced on whatever isn't dominant. And that's really what the trickster embodies. Um, and you see another interesting expression of this to me are native uh, indigenous cultures where transsexuals are given special status. Uh, often very powerful healers, they're often intellectually very powerful. 
um, the Cheyenne uh, MRNA, the Lakota Winter, uh, the Navajo Natal, you know, the transsexual. Um, part sometimes men dressing as women, sometimes a woman dressing as men, sometimes uh, um, hermaphrodite. Uh, they regard it as having special power precisely because they integrate opposites. They can see the world from a male and a female point of view. And so um, I think it's among the, the Navajo where the natal is actually involved in bringing the young men and young women together um, to you know, smooth the joining of the sexes and procreation of the tribe. Thank you. That may be a nice note to end on. Let's um, thank Louie, and then those of you who'd like to interact with him directly can come on up. Thank you.